على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله um, welcome everybody we're in uh, Ta'if it's July and I think people probably find it surprising that you can be in the Arabian desert and to have this type of incredible um, weather here is uh, one of the great blessings that Allah actually bestowed upon the people of Mecca because this was their Masyaf. This is where they came during the uh, summer, the hottest months of the summer they would come here. This was also the source of their food because Mecca, as you know, it's, it's rock. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it a valley that that had no uh, agriculture. Uh, and so they came here, and there was a tribe here, Bani Thaqif. People should know about them, one of the great Arabian tribes. They worshipped Alat, who was there, the goddess here. And um, the Prophet, وسلم, as you know, came here. This is also the burial place of Ibn Abbas. Some of the Sahaba, many of the Sahaba, after realizing the immensity of Mecca, couldn't live in Mecca after the revelation. So many of the Sahaba actually ended up in Medina and staying in Medina and not going back to their homeland, the Muhajirun. And Ibn Umar at the end of the Hajj, he would say, people of Yemen, go back to your Yemen. People of Syria, go back to your Syria. People of Iraq, go back to your Iraq. To encourage them not to stay in the Haram because the hukuk of Mujawara, the rights of people living in the Haram are so uh, awesome and daunting that they were uh, genuinely afraid to do that. In Medina, and this is one of the blessings of the Rahmah of Medina. Medina also has the maqam of the haram. It's a haram. And in the Maliki madhab, which is the madhab that I follow, uh, the, the haram of Medina is actually better than the haram of Mecca. That's the opinion of Imam Malik radiallahu Although the entire ummah is in agreement, all of the ulama of the Ahl sunnah are in agreement that the, the, the tomb of the Prophet is the holiest place. It's more holy than the Kaaba. That's by consensus. That ijma, it's in the Qadi, Qad Ayyad in his Shifa. He relates that as ijma from Asfarini and other ulama. So that's important to, to know that the Medina, and also the Rolda is in the paradise according to the sound hadith. So there is a place in Medina that we know is actually in uh, paradise, and that's not anything we know about Mecca. So both of them are sanctuaries. Uh, Allah made them uh, places of enormous blessing, but also places of enormous tribulation for people that are not aware of those blessings. So it's important. The comportment is essential while we're here. Even being this close to the haram yesterday, because in Maliki Madhab, you can't go into the haram without being in a haram. Like we don't have like the Shafi'i Madhab, you can go for other reasons or pass through. We can't do that. We got lost on the road yesterday, and we ended up in the haram. And I just didn't feel comfortable. because the first time that I'd been in the haram uh, like that without the haram on. So um, w w even in Ta'if, we're close to the haram. So just remember, it's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even though Allah is everywhere and sees uh, and knows everything that we do wherever we are, the, they say you know, the, a wrong action when you're near like if you're in the presence of your father and you do something wrong or your mother it's not the same as offending them uh, when they're absent it's, it's just uh, doesn't have the same they're both enormous but they don't have the same level of enormity so um, inshallah the Qurrat al absar is an amazing text. It's a Moroccan, traditional Moroccan text by Abdul Aziz al Lamti, one of the scholars from Meknes. And it's studied and memorized in Mauritania, very common for the women in Mauritania to memorize the text. Um, it's just over 400 lines. And it, it has a lot of things about the Prophet that 
people don't know about and don't really uh, think about. But um, before I do that, I want to uh, go into the text. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about love of the Prophet ﷺ and why people should get to know the Prophet ﷺ intimately um, and, and respect him in the way that's due to him. The, uh, the word in Arabic for respect is usually ihtiram, ahtarimuhu. And ihtiram has the word haram in it. So the, the root word is, uh, the root mastar is haram, which means a, a sanctuary. A and a sanctuary is a sanctuary because in English we say uh, sanctuary comes from a Latin word sanctus, which means holy, um, sanctified, we get that word from it. So the hurma is also a type of inviolability, like a woman in, in Darija here in Saudi Arabia, a woman's called a hurma because you, she's inviolable. You don't, you don't approach her, you don't uh, accost her, uh, you keep your distance from a woman. You have the same, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a similar idea behind the, the idea of the haram. There's things you don't do in the haram that you can do in other places. And that's the idea of the, the hurma. It's a type of respect. And it's often, in the West, people misunderstand, although it's abused, and there's no doubt about that, there's an abuse of the male-female dynamic uh, in a lot of the Muslim cultures. But if you look at the root of, of, of these rules, the root of the rules of comportment, as well as the obligations and the prohibitions, it's all based upon this idea of respect, of respecting the other, of the inviolability, the power also, respecting the power. Mecca has an immense power. Women have immense power over men. So there's a respect and a maintenance of that respect. Now the word uh, in uh, respect in Latin comes from a, a word which means to look back. Spectus is to see and then re is usually used something uh, back, to look back. Respect comes out of knowledge. There has to be a looking back at the object of respect, to know where they come from, to know what they've done, to know who they are. That's why we say, in English you say, you, d you, you don't demand respect, you command respect. It's something that comes out of knowledge, that when people have knowledge of somebody. When the, in Ramadan, um, Sheikh bin Mahfud, the son of Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, had they did a tea, Mauritanian tea service at uh, a, a cafe in, in Jeddah that's trying to be a center for learning and education. And in the Mauritanian uh, tea service, they had these two men doing tea and they served everybody tea. Now in this culture, tea servers are very low on the totem pole. It should be high on the totem pole because actually the, the, the uh, the, the big gods were at the bottom of the totem pole, the base. <laughs> the, the <laughs> so, but we, we didn't get that right, like many things with the Native Americans, so we didn't know that. So, but anyway, they were, they're low on the totem pole, the, the tea servers. So when they finished the tea service, Sheikhna got up and he said, you know, I'd like to thank the two tea servers, and by the way, both of them know the Quran according to the seven variants. Of, of, the, uh, of the recitations. And everybody was shocked in there because they're assuming these are just like servants, like people that just make tea. Um, and so suddenly they sh it shifts. Maybe you would have had a lot more deference when they were serving the tea because now you know something about them that you didn't know. The respect goes up. So when, 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 when you're introduced to somebody and somebody tells you he's a hafilb and he knows the seven variants, suddenly you have respect. If you didn't know that, you might not have the same degree of respect. Now, the, the people of inner science in our tradition, they try to inculcate in people an assumption of that in all people so that you, you have a type of deference to human beings because you don't know. And until they display otherwise, they should warrant that, that respect. That, that's the idea. That's the highest ideal. 
the uh, one, one of the Moroccan in Fez told me, La abdan asan yakun wali. You know, don't ever have contempt for somebody because he might be a friend of God. You don't know. And that's one of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, akhfa tharatha fi tharatha, akhfa sakhatahu fi ma'asiyatihi, wa akhfa ta'atuhu fi ridahu, wa akhfa awliya'uhu fi khalqihi. That Allah hid three things in three things. He hid uh, his anger in disobedience. So you don't know where, what will make God angry. Like the woman, people will say, you know, the hadith, a woman goes to hell for not feeding the cat. That seems like a pretty extreme uh, result of not feeding a cat. But what, what does not feeding a cat indicate? Because she wouldn't even let it go out to eat on its own. She just locked it up, like tortured it to death. That indicates a state of the heart. So the act itself might seem insignificant, because there's people, scientists all over the West that lock up animals and torture them uh, for uh, scientific reasons. But so we don't know where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put that, uh, his wrath. And then he hid his contentment in obedience. So the prostitute gives the dog some water in the Sahih Hadith, and, and the Prophet ﷺ said she was forgiven for it, which seems like an insignificant act to give a dog, yalhathu, he's panting from thirst, and she gives the dog water. So that act indicates something about her state, which is compassion. So in one hadith, we have a woman going to help for not feeding a cat. And it's not that she's a bad woman. We don't know other than that she didn't feed the cat. But in another hadith, a bad woman in the eyes of people, a woman of ill repute, is, goes to paradise for, for giving water to a dog. So another very insignificant act, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was where his pleasure was. And then he hid his saints or the people of wilaya, the people that Allah tawalla amrahum, that Allah takes it upon himself to, to take care of them. Those people Allah hid in his creation. Now we have signs, there's signs that you can know, but then there's some signs that you can't know. Because some of the awliya are really hidden. And you might think they're completely insignificant people. Like the black woman that used to sweep out the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. Nobody really thought she was anything of significance. But the Prophet ﷺ knew who she was. Because when she suddenly wasn't there anymore, he noticed immediately. Where'd that woman go? And they said, oh, she died. Why didn't you tell me so I could pray over her? So the Prophet ﷺ was concerned about who that woman was because uh, she, w she was something with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, it, it, it's important that idea of not just giving people respect because of who you think they are um, based on what you know about them, but giving them respect with the assumption that you might not know something about them that's very important. But with the Prophet ﷺ, there's no doubt that the more you know about him وسلم, the more you come to respect him and esteem him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one of the reasons that he sent him was uh, li, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, give him aid and to esteem him, to hold him in a high place of esteem, and esteem comes from a, a root word which we get estimation from. It's where you determine the value of something. So when you know the, the value of the Prophet, which is priceless, once you know that the Prophet ﷺ is priceless, that he is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has the highest station, then your esteem for him is inestimable. You can't put a value on it because it's beyond value. You can't work within a language of economics. 
So loving the Prophet Sallallahu having this respect for him is uh, extremely important. Now one of the things that respect uh, leads to is deference. And deference is, uh, you give deference to a person's, you know, the right of a person, the privilege, the position, the proper acceptance of a person, a type of courtesy uh, to the person. So it's defined as, showing deference is defined as yielding of judgment or preference from respect to the wishes or, or, or opinion of another, submission to another's opinion. So in deference to him, you say. This is exactly what we're told to do with the Prophet ﷺ, to yield our own positions to his position. That when the Prophet ﷺ says something, even if we want something else, we do what the Prophet ﷺ says. And the Prophet told us, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبع لما جئت به. None of you truly believes, this is Whenever you see la yu'minu, and then it gives a type of condition, it's, it really means none of you truly believes. So belief, adna iman, you know, the least of belief is just uh, to, uh, to accept tasdiq, uh, just believing. Well, fussur al-imanu bi tasdiqi wa khurfu wa nutqu fi al-khurfu bi tahqiqi. The iman was described like Imam al-Laqani says, Iman is interpreted, belief is interpreted as ascension, that you assent to something, you believe it, you accept it. So if somebody asks you, do you believe in la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, they say, naam, u'minu bi la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, we consider him a mu'min or her a mu'min, mu'mina. So that's the least of uh, the level. But the Prophet is talking about the perfection of Iman, because Iman is a continuum. We know in our own lives, there's times when Iman is higher and times when it's lower. We know when it's higher because our state with Allah is stronger. We're more aware of the hudud. We're more aware of wrong. If we do something wrong, it has more import. Uh, I know somebody, uh, we were with somebody the other day, and they missed Fajr, and he said that he spent a period of time doing muhasaba from the day before trying to figure out what he did that deprived him from missing the Fajr. That's a hal, that's a level of, of, uh, of awareness of your Lord in your deen that a lot of people don't have because a lot of people don't think about things like that, of why, why certain things, because if, if you're not, why certain things happen relating to your deen, people that are deprived of, if you had a word of Qur'an and then suddenly you're not doing it anymore, what happened? That's something that was taken away. It was a ni'mah that was taken away from you. And that's the nature of the deen is that we can lose uh, these blessings. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, none of you truly believes until his passion, his hawa, and passion is a good translation for hawa. Passion is a theological term that's used by the, the Christians. Um, which is an inclination, an appetite, appetite, uh, from apatere, to seek something. It's an inclination, it's a hawa, yahwi ilay. Allah describes uh, the af'idah, the hearts, as tahwi uh, ilay, that they incline towards Mecca, the hearts of some of the people, minanness, that some of the people, af'idah to minanness, that some of the hearts of the people incline. So there's a hawa is an incline. When najmi ida hawa, the star when it descended, right, moving down towards the uh, the horizon. So passion is a movement. It's a harakah fin nafs. It's a movement in the self to something. Now passion. When the Prophet ﷺ said, you don't believe until your passion is in accordance with my religion. That is how yuwafiqu shara. Now some of our natural passions, because passions fall into different categories. One of the categories is natural passions. Natural passions are those passions that we have just as our fitra nature. Eating is a natural passion. That's an appetite. It's a sensitive appetite. Um, sexual... Uh, 
desire, is a natural appetite. Now, these desires, if they're constrained by the intellect, are in, in accordance with the sharia. But then when they go outside of the, the, the constraints of reason, of the intellect, then they become something else. So for instance, Allah says, Kulu wa sharabu wa la tusrifu. Inna Allah la yuhibbu al-musrifin. Eat and drink, but not to excess. So the first is the hawa in accordance with the shara, because you naturally have a desire for food. So your desire for food is a natural inclination. And if it's within the, the bounds of reasonabil uh, reasonableness, then it's in accordance with the shara. But if it goes outside of those bounds, it's no longer in accordance with the shara. You've entered into israf and uh, tabdir. And Allah says those are the, 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 bre the brethren of shaitan. The shayateen, they're the brothers of the shayateen, the people that are extravagant. So that's an example of, of a hawa, a natural hawa. And then you have also the passion of the, the, the spiritual passions. So there are spiritual passions. For instance, uh, people have desire for God. That, that's a human desire to know God. It's a natural inclination of the soul to know their Lord because we, that it's part of our fitra and it's, it's, it's one of the reasons and the primary reason that we were created. So, but that in and of itself can become excessive. So when it leaves the boundaries of the sharia, when your search for God leaves the boundaries of sharia and you become excessive in something, for instance, total rejection of other people that aren't in pursuit of what you know to be true. Things like that. Also a type of extremism. Beware of extremism in the religion. Ghulu is from ghalaya to, to boil over. Ghalayan, it's to boil over. Where you become so zealous that you transgress the limits because that's what boiling over is. You're, out, you're going outside of the pot, right? I mean, everybody's had that experience in the kitchen when the, the soup or something suddenly goes over. You're wasting it now. The purpose was, was to cook it, but now something else has happened. It's boiled over, so something's gone wrong, and it creates a mess. And this is what happens when the religious appetite becomes excessive extreme, where it's not within the constraints of the sharia. So this is, this is important to note that what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us is that you, 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 sh you have to be within the limits, that when your hawa is in accordance with the hudud that my tradition has laid down, then you truly believe. That's why, لَا تَطْرُونِي كَمَا أَطْرَةَ النَّصَارَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ don't go to excess about me like the Christians went to excess about Jesus. Because what did the Christians didn't do that out of hatred for Jesus. They did it out of love of Jesus. It was excessive love. Just like some of the, the, the Muslim sects that deviated said things about Ali out of excessive love for Ali. There's even a group that said he was God, an incarnate of God, which is one of the miracles of Islam. Because nobody has ever said in the history of Islam that the Prophet was, was an incarnate of God. The Prophet's protected from that. But the Ali did not have that protection. So people said that about him. So the Christians went to that excess because of Hawa. The Hawa led to saying things about Jesus that were not true, but they didn't do it out of their lack of religion, they did it because their religion was excessive. La taghlufi dinikum. That's what Allah says to the, the people of the book. Don't go to excess in your religion. To the, we're told to tell them that. To tell the Ahl al-Kitab. Ya Ahl al-Kitab. Don't go to excess in your religion. Now, the assumption a priori is that you're not excessive in your religion because do you call people to a thing that you yourselves aren't practicing? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to tell the Christians don't be excessive in your religion. The assumption is you're not excessive in your religion. 
Because how can you tell other people? So learning about the Prophet ﷺ and learning about the respect and deference that is due to him is extremely important because the Prophet has rights over us. He said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه None of you truly believes until I am more beloved to him than his wealth, than his parents, his, 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 his children, his wealth and even his own soul that's between his sides. So the Prophet ﷺ said that we, our Iman's not complete until we actually love him more than we love anything in the world that's precious because he named the most precious things to people, their parents, their children, their, their wealth, and then their own self, right? Because people, you, you love yourself. I mean, Jesus said, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. The assumption is that we love ourselves. That's part of, of uh, uh, human nature, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us love. And what is love? Love is a very amazing word in, in English. It's an amazing word in Arabic. There are many words for love in Arabic. But the, the essential word is hub. That's the essential word. And love in... Uh, Love in, in, is a, it's, an old, uh, it's an old English uh, word that goes back to a Saxon word and, uh, and it relates to being pleased with, to be pleased with. It, and, and interestingly enough, our word believe is related to love, to believe, because you believe in what you're pleased with, what you love, things that your, you, your heart accepts are things that you believe. So love is related to acceptance, the idea that something you're pleased with, you have love for. And the, in, in Arabic, the word hub, which is the word the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه, more beloved to him. So the word hub uh, is a word, if you look at one of the root meanings, it's a seed. So love is a seed that's nurtured and, and it's nurtured with knowledge of the beloved. The more you know about the beloved, the more you love the beloved. So it's, it's a seed. The habba in Arabic is a seed. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu as you get to know the Prophet Sallallahu and you get to know him intimately, and that's one of the purposes of this text, is to know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intimately. As you get to know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intimately, um, he becomes Well, one of the descriptions of love is, is, they say, friendship on fire. That's, that's a description of love. That it, it's something that it, it starts to consume you. And we have people from our tradition who died of love of the Prophet ﷺ, literally died. We have people that bled tears of blood. And tears of blood, which is an old blues motif for people that know anything about um, about an American music. Uh, I'm crying tears of blood for you. Um, tears of blood are real because when somebody goes into a very intense, you get blood, those small little blood vessels in the eyes burst. And so it's a real thing, tears of blood. That's what Imam al Busayri, Amin Tadakiri Jiran Bidi Sarami, Mazaj Tadaman, Jaram in Muklatin Bidami. You know, that is it from remembering just the places the beloved used to go to that causes this mixture of tears and blood to flow from your eyes. So tears of blood, there's people that have wept tears of blood out of love of the Prophet ﷺ. There's people who have literally died from ishq, and, and ishq is... It's, it's another amazing word. The ashaqa is a, it's a type of vine that begins to grow around a tree and it strangles the tree. So it kills the tree. The Arabs say, الْعِشْقُ دَاءٌ قَاتِلٌ دَوَاءُهُ الْإِتِّصَالِ You know, the ishq is a, a deadly disease that can only be cured by connection, by being connected to the beloved, by the union, the wusul ila al-habib. And so the, uh, the, uh, the love of the Prophet ﷺ can, can really t 
take hold of the heart. Now, when you love somebody, you remember them. That's one of the attributes of love. You think about them. I mean, that's what happens when you fall in love and you call, I'm just thinking about you. I can't stop thinking. That's real. It's real. I can't stop thinking about you. I mean, why is that pressing on the, the heart? Because you're in love. That's what love is. I can't stop thinking about you. You write poems. You, you do think. Well, what is that effusion that's coming out of the heart to write poems? Really, and people write the worst poems when they're in love, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> they would never do it if they weren't. They would know how ridiculous it is, but it doesn't matter because there has to be some type of ta'bir. Now, what is ta'bir? You abiru, it's what you express. The, the word uh, ibra, which is a discerning lesson, something you gain, is related to abra, which is a tear. And it's related to i'tibar, which is respect. Respect, back to respect, a'tabiruhu. You know, I, I have respect for him. La ulqi lahu i'tibar. I don't give it any significance. So when something has significance and import and meaning, then it begins to affect the heart. And that's why even the remnants of the beloved, qifa nabki, min dhikri habibin wa manziri, this is the jahili motif of Naseeb in the jahili poetry is to Imr al-Qais begins his mu'allaqa by just saying stop my two friends let's look here at where the beloved used to be just to look nibki and weep over the traces of the beloved just to look these are jahili people these aren't this isn't uh, these are just people that knew what love was because Jahili Arabs had a, a deep and profound knowledge of hub. They really knew what love was and they were very intense in their love. They had intense love. But that's one of the motifs of just buka al atlal, just weeping over places where the beloved used to be. Amurru bidiyari diyara layla, uqabru dal jidar wa dal jidar, wa ma hub al jidari shagafna qalbi, wa lakin hubu man sakana diyara. I, I pass by the houses of Layla and, and kiss the walls of the houses. It's just so beautiful. You know, kiss the walls of the houses. But it's, it's not the walls that... Uh, have enraptured my heart. But love of the one that lives between those walls. That's why people come to Mecca and Medina. It's not the stones. You know, when you go to the tomb of the Prophet, it's, it's not the wajiha. But the wajah is amazing, and you could just stare at it and stare at it and look at it, even though you're not even supposed to, out of adab. But to look at the picture, you can look at a picture of the wajah for a long time and, and not grow tired of it. But it, it's just metal. It's a grate that somebody built. But it's, what, it's, it's what's beyond that metal. It's what it represents. And that's what all this is in the end of the day. That's all this. These are walls that are hiding the eternal and living God. That's what the world is. That's why when you, when you begin to understand that, you, that's what you love about the world. Not the dunya, the alam. The alam, Rabbul Alameen, Lord of all the worlds. The alam is, the Arabs call that ismu ala. It's, it's a noun of instrument. And alam is the instrument of ilm. It's the instrument by which you know something. And, the, and what you know it, from the world is the alim. It's, 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 it's God's vehicle for giving us knowledge. And that's why things are so important. That, that's why things... Things, ashia, you know, things are important. Possessions are important. That's why property is 
is one of the essential Im, Im, reasons why we were given Sharia ah, is to protect property because things are important, because things have meaning. The Prophet named all of his things. He didn't have many things, but the things that he had, he named them. He gave them names because they had meaning. And that's what the world is. It's meaning. It's meaning everywhere. The whole thing is meaning. It's ma'na. Like the poet said, this whole cosmos is meanings set up in images. And whoever understands that is from the people of discernment, the people of ibr, the people of fa'tabiru ya ulil abasar. Think deeply, give this ibra, give this, and then the ibra leads to abra. That's where the tears come. You know, they come from perception of meaning. You know, to really know what something means. It's just, it's an amazing thing to know what something means. You know, it's, it's a great gift that God gave to human beings. Adam al -asma, he taught man, he taught Adam the names, the ability to create meaning, to give meaning to things. Because the meaning is a transference, it's, it's a movement from something to another thing. So a name is a great meaning. If I say tree and suddenly in your mind, an image of a tree comes. That's meaning. That's, that is meaning. And that's why the more that you know about the Prophet the more powerful those meanings penetrate your heart when you understand his import, what he means, the ma'na, the meaning of the Prophet what he means, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم uh, He said, من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه From the beautiful Islam of a person is to leave what has no meaning for him. What has no meaning for him. ما لا يعنيه It doesn't have ma'na for him like gossip. What, what does that mean if you uh, know about so-and-so and such-and-such such getting a divorce? How does that affect you? What's the meaning for you? So meaning is, that's what this whole thing is about. And that's what, that's what the gift of this religion is. It, it gives meaning. That people, you know, the, the non-Muslim, uh, like some of the atheist people, not Christians, because Christians believe in meaning also, but some of the atheists, they say, oh, religion is just a way for people to find meaning. Exactly. We totally agree with you. <laughs> really, we agree with you. Because they say this is all meaningless. But we don't believe that because we know and experience and taste meaning and we know that it's real. It's real. All this other stuff is not real. But meaning is real. That is what's real about the world. And the greatest meaning, the highest ma'na in the world is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu So inshallah we'll get to look at, uh, at, at the uh, at some of those meanings, inshallah, in the text. Um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is, is going to, uh, to come later and give a talk. And his, uh, to translate for him is like, it, it, it's like, um, you know those, those guys that do the uh, jackhammers. jackhammers. If you've ever done jackhammer for two minutes, yeah, they do it all day. The, translating for Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is like jackhammer of meaning. 
impinging on, on my brain. So I'm going to save my brain a little bit for, for that. So, but inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a blessed trip for all of you. May it be a trip of Im immense meaning. May it be meaningful for you. And uh, may it draw you nearer, all of us, nearer to Allah and His Messenger. And may our hearts be open to meanings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts to, to the meaning of why we're here and what we should be doing and renew it in our hearts, inshallah, and give us more himma to do that, inshallah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala muslim wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.